and welcome. My name is Corinth Ald. I am Mercodia's Medical Science Liaison and the host of today's webinar. At any time, please type your questions into the Q&A box. I will hold the questions until after the presentation, at which time I will read them aloud and give our speaker a chance to answer them. I am delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jens Yul Holst, who is professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and Scientific Director of the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Basic Metabolic Research at the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Copenhagen. Professor Holst's scientific work has been focused on the regulatory peptides of the pancreas and gut and their importance <coughs> in the regulation of the functions of the GI tract and metabolism with particular focus on blood glucose appetite regulation, obesity, and diabetes. His great scientific achievements include the discovery of GLP-1 as the gut hormone responsible for the glucose-induced gastrointestinal stimulation of insulin secretion, as well as a number of key discoveries that have been the direct basis for the development of two new classes of drugs for type 2 diabetes, GLP-1 memetics and DPP-4 inhibitors. Research by Dr. Holst has also been fundamental for the development of GLP-2 agonists for the treatment of intestinal insufficiency or short bowel syndrome. Professor Holst is among the most cited European scientists in his field. He has published over 1,500 scientific publications, which have been cited over 50,000 times without self-citation. He has received several highly prestigious international awards, including the Claude Bernard Medal and Lecture in 2005, the Anders Yara Senior Medical Prize in 2013, and the Fernstrom Award in 2015. And in early 2016, he was awarded with the Advanced ERC Grant for a project entitled Bypass Without Surgery, which is a five-year grant. We are pleased to have him with us today. So without further ado, Professor Jens Yul Holst. So can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. So thank you very much, Corinne, <clears throat> for this introduction. And I'm very happy to be here and talk about GLP-1 secretion in humans and uh, some of the most uh, recent advances we have made. Uh, I think this is an important field, and I know that there are many people out there interested in measuring GLP-1, and that's what I will be talking about today. So what is GLP-1, I think, is the first question we have to put. And um, uh, what we see here is a diagram of the proglucagon molecule, which gives rise to GLP-1. And you can see that all these green bars here signify different molecular forms of GLP-1. And the point of showing this is that there are many of them. So what is GLP-1? That can be quite difficult to decide. Uh, so here is one molecular form. And as you can see, it occupies the amino acid residues number 78 to 107. It's also amidated, and that is the one that has biologically activity. Uh, so perhaps I, I, think, I think we should call that the real GLP-1 in some animals and also a little bit in humans. This form also exists, and it seems to be equally biologically active. But you can also see that there are products here that are shortened. This is 9 to 36 amide or 9 to 37, and these two molecular forms, they circulate in large amounts, but they are biologically intact, at least in terms of insulin secretion. And there are also some longer forms, as you can see here, and uh, they also are uh, relatively uh, inactive, uh, and also these are found in the circulation. So all of these contribute to what you could call the total picture of GLP-1 molecules in the circulation. So it's quite important what you do to find out to, how to measure this and to define before you start what you really want to go for. In addition, there may be additional products 
of this neutral endopeptidase enzyme, which is also found in the circulation, that can cleave the molecule at various positions and generating even more products. But I won't call them GLP-1s because they're broken down to quite small pieces. So um, where, do we, where does it come from? And here we have a section of the gut epithelium. These, this, is a, this, this is a villus here, and this is a crypt. And you can see these cells lighting up. They have been stained with an antibody against GLP-1. So you can see we have these endocrine cells in the gut, and they are the ones that secrete uh, the GLP-1 we have in the circulation. So this is a slide that shows the plasma concentrations of GLP-1 in uh, healthy control subjects and people matched with diabetes here, type 2 diabetic individuals over here. And what has happened is that these individuals were given 25 grams of glucose, 75 grams of glucose, or 125 grams of glucose orally. And that, as you can see here, resulted in GLP-1 secretion. Uh, they were also given these doses intravenously, and that did not elicit any secretion, as you can see here at the, at the bottom of this graph. But importantly, you can see this was the 25-gram dose, this was the 75-gram dose, and this was the 125-gram dose. And really, there's, of course, an increase from here to here, from the very low dose to the higher dose. But here, between 75 and 125 grams, the absolute increase is really the same, and the same is true for the type 2 diabetic individuals. But what happens with a larger dose is that the response is prolonged instead. So it's a quite peculiar pattern, as you can see. Definitely the AUC increases with the glucose dose, but the absolute concentration doesn't change a lot. So what's the explanation for this? And that's what we see here, because we also measured the gastric emptying rate in these experiments. So this is the gastric emptying rate after 25 grams of glucose, and this is the gastric emptying rate of the 75 gram, and this is the emptying rate after the 125 gram dose. And you can clearly see how this emptying rate is strongly inhibited by the increasing amount of glucose. And that's what uh, is my main conclusion from these experiments, that uh, the incretin secretion is really predominantly governed by the gastric emptying rate. So that's a very important factor for the secretion. It's perhaps the most important factor for the regulation of secretion of these gut hormones. Here we are looking at uh, concentrations of GLP-1 in the circulation of healthy individuals throughout the day. And as you can see in these studies, we also have measured GIP concentrations. GIP is the other incretin hormone, glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, and it also plays a role in insulin secretion. And up here, we have the actual insulin concentrations. These were young and healthy volunteers. They had large meals. And this is why everything is up for quite a while in this slide. But the question comes up here whether this really explains the insulin responses we have up here. So we went on to look at this in more detail. And here we have the experiments we did. What we did was to copy the GLP-1 and the GIP responses by intravenous infusions. So here we have the, GLP, the GIP responses up to 300. Let's have a look here. GIP up to 300, yes. And here we have the GLP-1 responses up to 50. Let's have a look again. Yes, up to 50. That's what we have here. Uh, so we managed to do this very well. And here we clamped the fasting glucose at its starting level, at its basic level here. And here we clamped it at one millimolar above and here at one millimolar above so that we were up to seven millimoles per liter here. And that covers, of course, the excursions we expect to find after ingestion of a meal. And then we started to look at insulin secretion. So here we have it. So this is insulin. And what you can see that is with the infusion of GIP and GLP-1 on top of the glucose, you, get, you got an increase in insulin secretion. The conclusion of this is that both of these hormones, GLP-1 and GIP, at the concentrations you see after ingestion of a meal, are able to increase insulin secretion even at the basal level of glucose. Uh, we see this because we clamp the glucoses. The glucose in itself didn't do anything, as you can see. So this proves the 
um, the effect, the incretin effect of these two hormones very nicely, and also show you that under normal circumstances, copying the normal responses, both of them are effective about equally. When we raise the glucose concentrations up to six millimoles per liter, the response is increased. As you can see, this is the glucose dependency of both of these hormones, and it nicely increases insulin secretion. And if we raise the glucose even further, uh, there is, of course, a rise in, in, in insulin by the glucose, but these two incretin hormones greatly enhance secretion, as you can see. To the right, we see something that is peculiar for GLP-1 compared to GIP, and that is inhibition of glucagon secretion. So the yellow line, of course, shows the glucose clamp alone, and glucose, of course, inhibits glucagon secretion, as it should be. But uh, GIP doesn't do anything that we can distinguish from the yellow line, but GLP-1 very significantly inhibits glucagon secretion at each of these infusion rates. So here we have something that clearly distinguishes um, GLP-1 from GIP. <clears throat> now, something interesting happens after GLP-1 is secreted, and that is that it is broken down by DPP-4, dipeptidyl peptidase 4, the enzyme, which is found both in the circulation and elsewhere. We'll come back to that. And what it does is to cleave off these two N-terminal amino acids, and that leaves a metabolite afterwards, as we have discussed so this is 9 to 37 or 9 to 36 amide, and this process is extremely rapid, and we have a um, half-life uh, because of DPP-4 in the circulation of only 1 to 2 minutes of, G uh, of GOP-1. And the metabolic clearance rate is 5 to 10 liters per minute, per minute, and that is about three times the cardiac output. And what that tells you is, of course, that this molecule survives for just a very short time in the circulation. Uh, there is no organ that can explain this extreme destruction. Uh, it is because it is broken down all the time, and there's never a steady state. So actually, it doesn't give a meaning to talk about the half-life. So if this was not the problem, then we also have the kidneys that are ready to eliminate GLP-1, and that alone provides a half-life of the molecule of four to five minutes at a high clearance. So how bad it is is viewed from this slide where you can see what happens if you give a large dose of GLP-1 subcutaneously to type 2 diabetic individuals. This is what survives in the intact form. And here we have the concentration of the metabolite mainly, plus the little bit of intact that is there. So you can see that about more than 90% of the molecule is broken down very quickly after the subcutaneous injection. Uh, and that tells you how extreme and th this destruction of the molecule is. What goes on is something that we looked at in more detail here in studies using an isolated perfuse porcine small intestine. And with this one, we can stimulate the lumen and we can collect the venous blood here. It's completely artificial, all of it, and we can measure what goes on. So this is what we found. So this is a stimulus that we can give so the preparation, intraarterial, it's a neuromedian C, it's a good stimulus for GLP-1 secretion, we knew that. Over here, we are giving luminal glucose, also a good stimulus for GLP-1 secretion. And here, we have been measuring the intact active molecule in the venous effluent from the gut. And you can see the response to neuromedian C and the response to glucose. And here, we are looking at the metabolite. So you can see already from the endocrine organ, from the endocrine gland that we have here, uh, most of what leaves the endocrine organ is already broken down into an inactive form. So this, of course, is quite dramatic. And uh, we know that this is because of DPP-4, because we can prevent that degradation completely with inhibitors of DPP-4, as we did in this experiment, with valine pyrrolidide. As we do that, these two curves come together completely. They're separate here, as you can see. They come together completely, and uh, that means that it's all protected and now in the intact form. So what goes on here is that GLP-1 is secreted from this L cell at the bottom of the crypt. This is an intestinal crypt here. We're just at the bottom. It's stained with an antibody against GLP-1. And what we have here is a capillary. And this capillary has been stained with antibodies against dipeptidyl peptidase 4. So what happens is that GLP-1 enters the capillaries 
and it's destroyed by DPP-4 very quickly after it has been secreted. There's a, it's possible to look at it, to view, it, view this in a diagrammatic form here. And here you can see the L cell sitting on the tip of a villus here. And what it does is to secrete GLP-1, intact active GLP-1, which then enters the capillary and meets endothelial cells that express DPP-4 so that at the end, when it leaves the gut, only about a quarter of what has been secreted survives in the intact form. The next that happens is that all this blood is delivered to the liver. And here in the liver, there's another set of DPP-4 molecules ready to destroy half of what comes to the liver, so that now we are down to about 12% entering the systemic circulation. Now, in plasma, there is even a soluble DPP-4 molecule present, and that can take care of a further degradation of GLP-1 so that eventually very little, about 10% probably, reaches the end organs, in this case, the pancreas. So that seems to be a very strange story, of course, but it's quite important for what we're looking at here because what, it, what may happen is that GLP-1 can interact while it is still in the intact form after the release with sensory afferent nerve fibers that will then send their impulses up to the, um, up to the brainstem uh, via the, these cells that have their cell bodies in the nodose ganglion and ultimately reach the um, nucleus of the solitary tract. And here impulses may either directly travel to the motor nuclei of the vagus nerves, which will stimulate secretion here from the pancreas and regulate motility, for instance, in the stomach, or they can ascend up to the hypothalamus, and that's where we see the actions, for instance, on appetite, but that will also uh, be, uh, be a possible to stimulate the brainstem where we have regulatory functions on the intestinal and abdominal organs. So this is what actually may happen. So you have the situation that it's broken down here by DPP-4, but it acts here. So that has consequences for what we need to measure when we want to measure secretion. Because what really happens is that these neurons are activated by the active GLP-1. But this GLP-1, which is active here, is degraded here. So what are you supposed to measure when you do this? You're, of course, supposed to measure the metabolite because the metabolite that is formed here active here. So if you want to know about secretion, you're interested in measuring the metabolite because the intact hormone is gone. If you want to measure activity of GLP-1, you also want to measure the metabolite because it already acts on the afferent sensory neurons. As a consequence of this degradation, as I told you, the, the changes in the concentration of active GLP-1 are very small in the peripheral circulation. This is a zero line, and these are the elevations in patients with type 2 diabetes or healthy controls, and they're very low, they're very low indeed, and many assays are not able to pick them up. Sometimes you will be very disappointed, sometimes you won't see anything at all. But we have the metabolite, and the metabolite will tell us here that there was a secretion down there in the gut, and actually there was a difference here between diabetics and healthy controls, as you can see, but there was a nice secretion. So you know that, and you know that it's been there and has been acting. So again, what are the interesting molecular forms? So this is the active form, this one and this one. These are the active forms. But in fact, what we find in the circulation is mainly this form and this form. So this is the metabolite. So this, of course, has implications for what we are supposed to measure. So for the measurements, here we have all these different uh, molecular forms <clears throat> in another way. So how can you measure these in a re really specific way? And all, the only way you can really get hold of the active form is by using uh, an assay that takes care of both ends of the molecule, if you will, uh, making sure that it's not uh, that is not too long in one end or not too short in the other end. In other words, you need a sandwich uh, approach, a sandwich ELISA to measure the active forms. But uh, for this form, this molecular form here, what is unique about it is really the C-terminus. So if you measure the amidated C-terminus, which is the important one in humans here, then you get both the active form and 
the metabolite, and that's what you are really interested in. You may also pick up this, of course, but usually it is a less dominant form. So intact, specific requirements, sandwich 7 to 37 or 36 amide assay. And its sensitivity must be very, very great. Uh, better than 0.5 picomoles per liter, I would say, and a range up to 20 picomoles per liter. Um, that will be what you need if you want to go for the intact. There are a few avail available out there uh, now also from, um, from um, uh, our company. And total uh, assay here uh, is, of course, what you're really interested in if you want to measure secretion and uh, actually also actions. And it must react fully with 9 to 36 amide, not just partially. It must have a sensitivity around 1 picomoles per liter, and it, it should be possible to reach an upper range in normal plasma up to 100 picomoles per liter. There are some assays that can do that, uh, but not all. And that is really one of the problems, to have a good assay for this. Uh, particularly if you're going for rodent studies, you really have another problem, which is volume requirement. And it's very important that um, you can do this because in a mouse, for instance, the volume you can pull out is very small. But on the other hand, why would you measure incretins? And again, this discussion of intact versus total, let's have a look at it. So here's a study where it was useful to do all of this. So here we have patients with type 2 diabetes on diet and exercise. And here we have patients on metformin. And what we are really interested in, uh, these are pa patients that are then treated with citagliptin or vildagliptin, the two DPP-4 inhibitors, or placebo. And what we wanted to see in this study, for instance, is what happens. So here are GLP-1 concentrations, and what we're looking, looking at up here are intact concentrations. So citagliptin and vildagliptin are supposed to elevate the concentrations of the intact hormone. The, they inhibit DPP-4. And sure enough, that's what we find. As you can see here, citagliptin and vildagliptin were about equally effective compared to placebo. Another thing you see here that those treated on met, with metformin, they have higher concentrations of intact GLP-1 and even higher when you put on top citagliptin and vildagliptin, showing very much the same result. So the conclusion of this study was that citagliptin and vildagliptin were equally effective with respect to preserving uh, uh, GLP-1 in the intact form, and also one of these surprising observations that metformin actually stimulates the secretion of GLP-1. Let's see how this fans out when we look at total GLP-1. So total GLP-1 didn't change much, much here. Over here, once the st secretion is stimulated with metformin, you actually see that if anything, there's an inhibition by the two DPP-4 inhibitors of secretion uh, compared to placebo, and that is due to a feedback, and we know this process, a local feedback where increasing concentrations of the intact hormone feedback on the L cell to inhibit the secretion. So the total secretion goes down, but the intact hormone concentrations rise, and they rise more than the secretion goes down, if you will, so that the net effect is a nice increase in the concentration of the intact hormone. So this experiment really tells you a lot of the important things about these inhibitors and also about metformin for the treatment of uh, type 2 diabetes. So this was an example of where it can be very useful to have an assay for intact GLP-1 and where it is very essential for the interpretation also to have an assay for total GLP-1. <clears throat> now let's have a look at the incretin effect in type 2 diabetes. The incretin effect, of course, is the amplification of insulin secretion that you see when you take in glucose orally as opposed to intravenously. Here it is. In type 2, it is much, much lower. It's very weak. Uh, so what has happened? And uh, the question you can ask is, what about the secretion of these incretin hormones, GLP-1 and GIP? Today we are talking about GLP-1. And uh, here is a study where we looked at this, and what we're doing here is that we are measuring total GLP-1, of course, because this is what shows us what happened in the L cell. The intact hormone concentrations are probably low and may be very disappointing. So here you can see that in these type 2 diabetic individuals, 
Here we have the controls. Here we have the type twos. There is an impaired secretion, particularly late in the phase, in the postprandial phase. And we actually had some people with impaired glucose tolerance that positions themselves right in the middle here, suggesting that this is something that develops with type two diabetes, and that is indeed what we think. So um, we have analyzed all these things, and I've, I've written articles about this, uh, about the factors leading to impaired GLP-1 secretion and type 2 diabetes, and high BMI seemed to be a very important thing. Insulin resistance was also found to be a factor that could decrease secretion of GLP-1. Hyperglycemia in itself, perhaps via interference with gastric emptying, can do it, as written here. And a long duration of diabetes and a poor metabolic control was also associated with impaired secretion. And then, of course, uh, whether or not you have metformin may increase GLP-1 secretion and influence the results in, for instance, the placebo group. So uh, there's no doubt uh, in my mind that uh, diabetes is associated with a problem in terms of uh, GLP-1 secretion. Actually, this is an interesting experiment, I think. Uh, what happens when you do this? And here we looked at people um, <clears throat> that had uh, gestational diabetes. And here they are looked at while they were having that gestational diabetes and were pregnant, as you can see here. And then postpartum, when they had com regained completely normal glucose tolerance, their GLP-1 responses were restored to absolutely normal levels. So this, again, suggests that this is something that may develop along with uh, the development of diabetes. We have been able to study this in more detail in a wonderful collaboration with a Finnish group of, of workers here with Magikainen and Pietilainen, uh, the study from Diabetes Care, where we looked at 35 monopsychotic and 75 dipsychotic twin pairs that were discordant and concordant for obesity. And we looked at the heritability of GLP-1 responses to OGT and also the influence of an acquired obesity on GLP-1 during an OGT or meal test. And what we found was that while the GLP-1 response to the OGT definitely is heritable, it also turned out that an acquired unhealthy pattern of obesity characterized by liver fat accumulation and insulin resistance was closely related to impaired GLP-1 responses in young adults. So we're very happy about this study, which I think is, is, gives, gives great clarity. To finish this kind of angle of looking at the increase in effect in type 2 diabetes, we also did this study in a large number of individuals, 1,462 of them. And these individuals were classified according to an OGT as normal glucose tolerant, free diabetics, or people with diabetes. <clears throat> this was diabetes at screening. They were not selected, to, uh, they were rather selected not to have diabetes. So individuals with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes at screening had 16 to 20% GLP-1 concentrations compared to those with normal glucose tolerance. The obese and overweight individuals had a 25% and a 15% reduced GLP-1 response compared to normal weight after adjustment for age, sex, and glucose status. And a higher GLP-1 response was associated with better insulin sensitivity and beta cell function higher age, and lower degree of obesity. And I think this summarizes nicely a lot of things that are out there regarding the secretion of GLP-1. It's probably not the main reason for the loss of incretin effect in type 2 diabetes. That is the loss of activity of these hormones on beta cell function. But this, if it's present, certainly contributes. So um, having looked at this uh, thing, this degradation by native GLP-1 that so vastly limits the, the clinical potential of GLP-1, uh, we were interested in looking at this uh, in more detail, and uh, we came up with the proposition many years ago now that inhibition of dipeptidyl peptidase 4 could be a useful adjunct in the management of type 2 diabetes, and we were very much inspired by ACE inhibitors to treat hypertension uh, in this. And also, we found that GLP-1 analogs resistant to uh, this amino terminal metabolism could be useful for the therapy. So this was really a very uh, interesting paper. 
And what happened, of course, was that all these DPP-4 inhibitors were developed, and what they do is very effectively inhibit DPP-4 and plasma for up to 24 hours. As you can see here, here are some of the important inhibitors that are available out there. So this was absolutely possible. And what happens is that, yes, sure enough, as I've shown you already a couple of times, GLP-1 increases uh, by a factor of 2 to 3. This is before and this is after 28 days of therapy. GIP is also protected, which is interesting. Uh, we'll talk about that another time. Uh, also showing nice increases. And importantly, glucagon secretion is also inhibited, which is one of the actions of GLP-1. So this is what happens after this. Now, I also touched upon this business about metformin. And here is actually a more detailed study of this where we are looking at some healthy subjects and looking at exactly intact GLP-1 levels after ingestion of a meal. And you don't see much, as you can see here. But then you can give a DPP-4 inhibitor, and you will get the increase in intact GLP-1, as you expect. But also metformin did this. And together, as I've already indicated, you get an additive response, very nice, large response of GLP-1. And I think that is very, very interesting. And the same can be observed in type 2 diabetic individuals, precisely the same kind of movements here as you see. So um, uh, that, there's no doubt that this is one of the interesting features of um, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, DPP-4 inhibitors and metformin, that it raises these concentrations and secretion also of GLP-1, and it has consequences for the glycemic excursions here with placebo here, uh, with the two signal individual therapies and then with the combination of metformin and sitagliptin here. I think this is very interesting, and we have we worked a little bit more with this stuff here. And uh, so here we're looking at people, uh, again, type 2 diabetic individuals. We're looking at GLP-1 concentrations, and now we're back to total GLP-1 because this is what tells us about the secretion. And what we're looking at here is what might be the consequences of this increase in GLP-1 secretion that we see with metformin. And we can study that by using this molecule, Exendin 9 to 39, which is an antagonist of the GLP-1 receptor. So we can block the actions of GLP-1 if they do anything here. So the experiment is shown here. Here's placebo and saline. This is this one. And then we give the metformin. Here we have the effect of metformin to increase GLP-1 secretion. And then we give them Exendin 9, as you can see here, and that also increases the secretion of GLP-1. Again, this is this feedback mechanism that is eliminated, and now uh, we get this increased secretion of GLP-1. And we, when we give the two together, we get an even further increase in the secretion of GLP-1. So they work together on this. And if you look at the uh, areas out of the curves here, you see again the saline, the effect of metformin, the effect alone of Exendin 9, and the effect of the combination. So quite large uh, effect. So let's have a look at the glucose concentration. So here you have the meal response, and here with the placebo, and the next one is with metformin. Metformin works as it should. This is what happens if you take away GLP-1 from the equation with Exendin 9, a considerable impairment of the glucose excursions. And, but if you add then metformin, you still have some action of metformin. Let's have a look at the A1Cs to get this more clear. Here we have them. So the placebo experiment is here. That's the A1C of glucose. You add metformin to the patients, it improves their glycemic excursions as expected. You add Exendin 9, it grossly impairs the glucose excursions, as you can see here. You then add metformin to Exendin 9 to 39, and you can see that metformin still works. But this is what you should have observed, right? So if you take away, if you take away GLP-1, metformin doesn't work so well any longer. And the conclusion of this, of course, is that there are separate effects of metformin, but some of the effect of metformin may very well be due to GLP-1 secretion and action. We are working more with that uh, now, and it's very interesting. 
So uh, one of the one of the things that have been most instructive for us in our work with GLP-1 over the last couple of years has been the work with gastric bypass patients. Of course, these patients have this dramatic weight loss, and they have diabetes resolution even before the weight loss is seen. So something very interesting is going on, and that's what we're looking at here. So the mechanisms of diabetes resolution after bypass, as we see them, uh, involve the following things. So you have a perioperative calorie restriction, and that in itself results in a doubling of hepatic insulin sensitivity, which is further improved with time, and this is undoubtedly one of the very important mechanisms. But now to the secretion of GLP-1. So what you have is an unretarded passage of nutrients into the small intestine, and that results then in a very abnormal high exposure of the distal small intestine with a high L-cell density, there are many of them, to the digestive nutrients and secretion, and you get exaggerated release of GLP-1, which then acts on the pancreas to increase glucose secretion. And we'll have a look at that. With time, the weight loss will step in, and we will have a further improvement in insulin sensitivity, both in the liver and in the periphery, and uh, that in itself may result in a major diabetes resolution. So that is, of course, also important. So have a, have a look at it. So this is what happens with the absorption of paracetamol after a Wuhan Y. And what you can see here is that before operation, we have this normal absorption curve. But after the operation, immediately, day three, you get this incredibly high absorption rate. Actually, these are the highest time points. So that means that the absorption rate of paracetamol is incredibly increased after this in, in, uh, operation. And that then results in this uh, great absorption rate of glucose also and a high exposure. And that's when we get the GLP-1 secretion as is shown here. So type 2 diabetes and normal glucose tolerant individuals over here. And this is before the operation, the small response down here and here. And then you can see that already one week after and certainly three months after and one year after, we have up to a 30-fold increase in the secretion of GLP-1. And let me just show you what it looks like in terms of total GLP-1 here and intact GLP-1 in one of the studies we did where we did measure intact GLP-1. And you can clearly see this is before, this is after. That's a huge rise in the intact concentration. So in these patients with a very, very high uh, rate of secretion, we do see a very large response of intact. But compare it to total over here, which tells us how much GLP-1 is really secreted. The two curves look alike, but note that the scales is almost a tenfold difference here. Uh, so uh, there's a huge difference in total secretion, and that's what tells you what the L cells are really doing. This is just about 10% of what you're seeing. So the consequences for insulin secretion are shown here. Uh, this is before, this is after, and you can see there's a left shift of the insulin dose response curve. Very nice increase here, early increase. And actually, if you look at this profile, what does it look like? It looks more or less like the profile in the normal glucotolerant individuals before they were operated. So you can say that, in a way, insulin secretion is normalized while we're doing this. <clears throat> so how can, we, how can we find out if GLP-1 really is responsible for this uh, change in insulin secretion? We can do that by using the Xenden 9 molecule, uh, and so what we did was to look at a meal before the operation. The operation is here, one week after, three months after. And we did that on two occasions. And on one occasion, we gave Xenden 9, the GLP-1 receptor antagonist, and blocked the effects of GLP-1. So we took a lot of samples to estimate this, sodium chloride or Xenden 9. And here is the result. So here we're looking at insulin secretion rates calculated from C-peptide uh, concentrations, of course, and uh, this is the insulin secretion rate before, and this is one week after, and this is three months after. And you can see the flat and sluggish insulin response before the operation, and the improvement and the left shift of the curve after the operation, also at three months. Here are the corresponding AUCs. And now we can look at what happened if we block the GLP-1 receptor. So before the operation, there's a clear lowering of this. But after one week, you can see a dramatic lowering of the insulin response at certainly three months after. And in fact, if you look at it, three months after, 
when you block the GLP-1 response, the insulin secretion is completely back to what it was before the operation with sodium chloride instead. So all of what was gained by the operation in terms of insulin secretion can be removed with a GLP-1 receptor antagonist. <clears throat> and here we are looking at glucose tolerance. So this is what happened before the operation. This was one week after and three months after, and you can see the nice improvement here in the fasting glucose in this period. And here, if we look at two-hour values, we have 10 millimolar here, 8 millimolar here, and 6.5 millimolar over here, a tremendous improvement in glucose tolerance, actually a normalization. And here you have the AUCs. So what happens if you block the GLP-1 receptor? This is what happens. So a considerable impairment of glucose tolerance before and certainly also after the operation. And again, if you compare the AUC here, after you have blocked the GLP-1 receptor with what happened before the operation, you can see that all that was gained is lost after blockade with the GLP-1 receptor antagonist. So this, is, this tells us that this was very important in terms of uh, the effect on insulin secretion and glucose tolerance. Another interesting thing is, what about the food intake? Is GLP-1, which has a certain anorexic effect, is it also responsible for some of the food intake problems here? And what we're looking at here is effects or a study where we infuse the GLP-1 into people uh, or PYY or the two together. So here we have the PYYs, here we have the GLP-1s, and you can see that these are not too unphysiological. We're up to 60. I showed you 50 before. These are, of course, totals. So that was the ambition. Let's have a look at what happened. So here we're looking at energy intake, and this was GLP-1 alone. Not a lot happened. PYY 3 to 36, which is the active form, not a lot happened. But together, they had a pronounced effect on food intake, as you can see here, much greater than the sum of the two. So uh, let's have a look at this. GLP-1 impact on food intake. So this is after extended 9 at libitum in, uh, intake in people before the operation, before the Y gastric bypass. And when we block the receptor, they eat more. This tells us that GLP-1 normally acts to inhibit food intake. And what we then did was to look at uh, after the operation, three months after the operation, and we gave the antagonist, and what happened? Nothing. So this was very confusing to us because we had been convinced that GLP-1 in these large amounts would have an effect on food intake. But then we started to analyze the situ situation a little bit more closely, and what we found is that the total GLP-1 concentrations appeared like this. So this was pre-operative uh, with, and then was after the extended 9, as you can see the increase that we talked about previously. And after the operation, we had the increase in GLP-1, as I have shown you, but with extended 9, an even larger increase. Again, this feedback regulation that you can interfere with with the antagonist. And here we have PYY. So what happened to PYY? Well, this was the increase that we have after the operation. But then uh, what you see here is that also extended 9 or caused a tremendous rise in the secretion of PYY. And why is that? Well, PYY is secreted from the same cell as GLP-1, the L cell. So apparently this feedback mechanism also applies to PYY secretion. So uh, that means that if you really want to study GLP-1, uh, and PYY effects on food intake after this operation, you really have to interfere with the actions of both hormones. So what we did uh, was to, again, use the uh, receptor antagonist XND9 to block GLP-1 actions. Uh, for PYY, we don't have an antagonist, but we could do something else. PYY is secreted in the form of 1 to 36. That is inactive in terms of food intake, it must be cleaved by DPP-4 first to generate PYY3 to 36, which is then the active form. And for that, we can use a DPP-4 inhibitor and block the actions of DPP-4 and prevent the formation of the active form. So that's what we did. We did meal tests here in people after the Y gastric bypass operation here. So a standard meal here and, and a libitum test meal over here. And then what we could do was to study all of this on a placebo day, 
but also on an extended nine day where we blocked the actions of GLP-1. And we could do it on the at DPP-4 inhibitor day when we blocked the formation of PYY or on a day when we blocked both of these two hormones. And uh, uh, the result of this can really be seen on these concentrations. And again, here we are looking at both intact and total GLP-1. And that tells you this is one of the situations where you really have some fun of measuring intact GLP-1. So here's placebo, here's with the DPP-4 inhibitor, here's with extended 9 the rise, and here's with the combination that gives us a tremendous rise in GLP-1. So again, confirming that if you interfere with both of these processes, you have a tremendous rise in GLP-1. And the next one will show us PYY, so total PYY over here, and 3 to 36, the active one, let's have a look at it. So the placebo study, is uh, here, um, here where, where we have here we have the placebo study, and then we block the formation of PYY, and you can see that it is possible with a DPP4 inhibitor to almost completely wipe out this. And then we have the combination of DPP4 and XN9 that causes this huge increase in PYY, and that of course explains that when we only block uh, GLP1 actions, then we will have. Um, a very, very large rise in PYY that can substitute for the missing GLP-1. And then after, uh, with the combination here, you come down to this result here, a very nice suppression of the formation of uh, PYY 3 to 36. And so that is what, really what happened. So what happened to food intake? Here we have the placebo study with XND9, nothing significant. With DPP-4 alone, nothing significant. But with the combination, we had a 20% increase in food intake. So this is the contribution of the two hormones together. And that explains us that these two hormones are very important for the inhibition of food intake and therefore the weight loss after gastric bypass operations. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, what we did. And uh, we are now interested in, in trying to understand why the secretion of these two hormones is increased so much. And let me just show you two examples of this. And what I'm trying to show here is that it's really the change of the architecture more than any specific development in the gut that is responsible for this. So here we had the opportunity to study a male, uh, 50 years old, uh, with insulin therapy here. And after his operation, uh, they suspected a leakage. So a gastric tube was positioned here to allow feeding of the patient while he was recovering from what they thought was a leakage. So there wasn't any leakage, but nevertheless. And five weeks later, when he was well, we were able to examine the patient on two consecutive days. One day where we gave him a liquid meal, uh, either through the mouth, or another day where we gave it directly into the stomach, bypassing, if you will, the bypass. So this is via the bypass. This is uh, via the old route, via the stomach. And here you see the glucose concentration. And this is uh, via the old route, the bypass. And this is via the stomach, the old, the old route. And you can clearly see that this person in two days, in the two consecutive days, changing from having diabetes and to become well. And that is accompanied by a huge increase in GLP-1 secretion on the bypass day, in the old route, and increase in insulin secretion. And if you put the two together, you can clearly see that the GLP-1 response comes right before the insulin response. And here we have it. Uh, and that resulted then in the complete beneficial action of this. Now, we've recently had the chance to look at the reverse, where we had a person, a person who was operated with a Wuhan Y and uh, had to develop severe hypoglycemia after the operation. And something had to be done. So the surgeons managed to reverse the one y gastric bypass. And up here you can see before the operations the hypoglycemic response that he developed. And you can also see the insulin responses that were huge. And also you can see the GLP-1 response, which was huge as expected. But after the reversal, glucose improved a lot and he has no more hypoglycemia. Insulin come back and GLP-1 comes completely back to where it was. So we have both of these observations that tell us that it's really the surgery, it's the surgical rearrangement that results in the exaggerated GLP-1 secretion that again results in a, a hypersecretion of insulin and sometimes so much that people will even develop hypoglycemia. So 
<clears throat> I think um, I'd like to conclude now that uh, there are a number of important issues here that I'd like to emphasize. GLP-1 is, of course, a product of proglucagon, and the differential processing of this molecule creates many molecular forms, so you really have to make up your mind as to what you're looking for. The main bioactive form is proglucagon 78 to 107 amide, GLP-1 7 to 36 amide, intact or active GLP-1, as people call it, which is rapidly cleaved by DPP-4, creating the metabolite GLP-1 9 to 36 amide. Before the degradation, GLP-1 may activate sensory vagal afferent nerves, and this is what we think, how we think that the, the natural hormone works. Because of this, then both secretion and action are best evaluated by measuring the sum of intact GLP-1 and the metabolite. <clears throat> and that is, of course, total GLP-1. So this is important. If you want to know about secretion and action, you should measure total GLP-1. The measurement of intact GLP-1 is, of course, interesting in special situations, and I've shown you some of them to illustrate this, for instance, to evaluate the effect of DPP-4 inhibition. GLP-1 is a major increase in hormone, stimulating insulin secretion, but also inhibits food intake, probably via neural mechanisms, as I've shown you. The secretion of GLP-1 is impaired in obesity and very often in type 2 diabetes the secretion is stimulated by nutrients, and gastric emptying rate is the main regulating mechanism. I showed you that, and that's what we also observed in the um, bypass patients. Because of accelerated nutrient entry into the intestine, gastric eye bypass operations cause dramatically elevated secretion rates, and this probably explains some of the effects of bypass on glucose metabolism and body weight also. And finally, I just mentioned this new interesting uh, research field that metformin increases GLP-1 secretion, and uh, I gave you some evidence that uh, perhaps part of the actions of metformin is really due to the actions of GLP-1 secreted uh, after metformin therapy. So I think I'd like to conclude my presentation here, and thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you for an excellent and very interesting presentation. So we do have time for a few questions. And we'll start with this one. As GPR-119 agonists can modulate GLP-1, do you think there is potential of these agonists in the treatment of diabetes? Yeah, this, this, is a, this, is, this is one of the things that we are really trying to work out in our own laboratory. We are using some experimental models to look at this, and in particular we have great fun in looking at secretion from isolated perfused gut preparations, both from mice and from rats and from pigs, and where we are trying to understand precisely the mechanisms that cause elevations of TLP-1 secretion and understand what goes on in bypass. And GPR-119 is definitely one of the interesting uh, receptors that we have, which may be involved. Uh, so far, GPR-119 is perhaps not the most important one of them, but it's certainly one of those that we have. But the principle, I think, is important. That, uh, that is to try to understand the mechanisms of secretion and therefore to stimulate endogenous GLP-1 secretion, which is likely to be actually more effective than uh, any uh, exogenous uh, 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 treatment with GLP-1 agonists. So we th this is a major line of research in our laboratory, and, and we're working hard to understand how we can do this. Okay, great. Thank you. Second question, does diabetic neuropathy make type 2 diabetes resistant to increased GLP-1 due to damage to intestinal innervation? So we have looked at this, and I, I must say that we have not looked at a large number of people with severe neuropathy. But from the few where we have been able to look at this, we cannot see that there is a that, that, is, that is, it is the autonomic neuropathy itself, which is very important. In fact, I'm not sure that, that some of the extrinsic nerves to the gut are very important for GLP-1 secretion. You know, the GLP-1 cell, the L cell is a stupid cell that only lives for four days, and, you know, then it's shredded into the intestinal lumen, and probably it doesn't, uh, you know, it's, it's not a very elegant cell. It's just doing its job, reacting to food stuff that enters the gut, then it secretes some GLP-1. And then it's shed and dies. Uh, so, so that's the story. I'm, I'm not sure that the that the neural regulation is very important for these uh, uh, endo, uh, these uh, increase in hormones. 
<clears throat> okay. And the next question is, do you believe that an ileal interposition could work even better than a gastric bypass in terms of control? Yeah, <clears throat> this is an interesting thing, and it has been studied in a number of models, both in people and in experimental animals. And ileal interposition is actually a good procedure that causes an, a, a nice and effective increase in the secretion of GLP-1 and actually of GLP-2 as well, which we have been publishing about some time ago. <clears throat> and it is part of some of the surgical techniques that are being used and developed, particularly in Brazil and other South American countries. Uh, so, yes, I think this is an interesting thing. I know that David Cummings is very interested in uh, looking at this and also thinks highly of the potential of ileal interposition. What it does is, of course, to um, bring a segment of the gut with a high density of L cells up more proximally where there's a greater um, exposure to uh, unabsorbed nutrients, and this then should be the mechanism, and indeed it works. So I think it has the potential. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. <clears throat> okay, so it looks like that is all the questions that we have today. Again, at this okay. time, I'd like to thank our distinguished speaker, Professor Jens Juel-Holst, and thank you to everyone who joined us. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar.